If you obey the market for 30 years, you begin to worship it and believe it has power over your life. The purpose of a tyrant, right, is to make anything else unimaginable. The first dictatorship is the dictatorship in your mind. There are no superheroes. The only superhero who's going to save us is ourselves. And that's what that 99 means. It's us, the 99%. I'm Paul Mason, an activist, anti-fascist, and a radical humanist. I'm Molly Crabapple, a writer, journalist, and artist. Guantanamo is a place that runs on secrecy and on censorship. But as an artist, I had an advantage. I could draw around the censorship. As a journalist, I've spent much of my time covering protests all over the world. The people on the streets today are the same people who've been on the streets protesting against austerity since 2010. I document people fighting oppression, often against impossible odds. I drew this right next to the riot cops. I explore how our global economic system paved the way to a new authoritarianism. With art and with words, I document the ways that people are fighting back. Will technology provide the solutions? Will the tools we use to communicate and organize become our undoing? Or are we sleepwalking? a global social dystopia. Paul, me and you share something. We're both people that were deeply changed by 2011, a year of mass uprisings that spread from Wisconsin to Egypt, to New York, to Greece, to Syria. I got my start as a journalist going down to Zuccotti Park where the Occupy Wall Street protest encampment was and trying to draw the people there. You covered pretty much everything. So what was that about? Tell me what 2011 meant, Paul. Well, um... I think it was the rebirth of the anti-capitalist imagination. And I'd seen that imagination die. I was born in 1960. So my dad's generation, coal miners, cotton spinners, very heavily trade unionized, they were smashed. And it, for me, the kind of death of imagination wasn't about the Soviet Union collapsing. I never, I never cared about the Soviet Union, nor did most of the people I knew who called themselves left wing. We cared about our ability to, what sociologists call, to have agency. We saw the ability of groups of people to change the world and then we saw that smashed. And then I'm covering the student protests here in London and suddenly we saw a, a new kind of person emerge. What you realise, you're, you're witnessing a historic rebirth of something. And for me, yeah, it's, it's the imagination, the ability to say in your mind, this kind of capitalism isn't working. Uh, a carbon-based economy isn't working. Dictatorship after dictatorship suddenly looks illegitimate and weak and stupid and elderly, so we can change things. That's what I think it was. Uh, I mean, we both know, because we covered it, you know, and we're right in the middle of it, that things went wrong with it. But to me, it's a bigger moment than 1989, before the Berlin Wall. It's a bigger moment than 68. It's, it's the turn of history back towards the possibility that everything you see outside this window, this financially corrupt hierarchical world, could one day... <laughs> be changed in a way that favours human beings. Well, it was an attempt, right, to create a sort of utopia and microcosm. Yeah. Every single one of those squares, whether it was Tahrir Square in Egypt or whether it was Zuccotti Park, was a place where they were trying out a new society. There was always a free kitchen, and most importantly, there was always a library, right? <laughs> These were places where even in really sexist societies, women, you know, they stood as fighters, right? Mm. And... These places, they didn't just fizzle out. That's always the, the narrative. No, they were violently smashed. They were murdered yeah. in some cases, or in other cases, like in my city, they were just beaten and you know, shoveled away with dump trucks. But 
The truth is that except in a few places like Tunisia, the protests of 2011, they, they did fail. And I want to ask why? Why did they fail? And did they fail? Am I wrong? Maybe challenge me well, on I, that. No, I, I think it's quite hard to succeed when you're unarmed and there are militarised police forces whose job it is to, to smash your head. Um, I think they didn't, they didn't fail in this sense. When, what I noticed is that there was a... The network, the information network, had created a resilience. Social psychologists now talk as if, for the first time in modernity, i.e. 400 years, we are back to a point where our minds can be hyper-social with each other without having to stand in a public square and hold a meeting. So I, I think that's what wasn't defeated. There was a sudden realisation that lots of people my generation thought, you know, the, these guys wandering around with their the earbuds, you know, the white earbuds, are individualised and they're in a bubble and they don't care about anything else. But what we didn't realise is that that bubble was full of networked connections. And that's what I think the most profound uh, ever, uh, impact of it was. And I mean, it must have been profound for you because your art, it most clearly changed under the impact of having this iconic protest take place almost outside your door. It changed everything for me. Occupy Wall Street felt like love. Occupy Wall Street was the space where I found my political voice, where I realized that I could be smart, where I realized I could speak. Before Occupy, I was an artist, a pretty well-known artist in my world, but one who spent all of her time drawing in nightclubs, drawing the sort of rich hedge fund people who had destroyed the world and then drawing my glittering friends who danced for them and entertained them. And I became a writer because of Occupy. I was arrested the first anniversary of Occupy. I remember, I remember you tweeting me, the, <laughs> you, tweet, you sent me a message of the picture. It said, you, for people who haven't seen it, you've got your hands behind your back and, and, and you're looking pretty defiant. I was pretty defiant. I had a police officer uh, grab me by the arm, pull me into the street and uh, arrest me for blocking traffic. And my first piece of writing that ever really meant anything was an article about my arrest. And I wasn't angry because I had such a bad arrest. I didn't. No one hit me. You know, it certainly was a far easier arrest than, you know, black and brown people in America face every day for doing nothing. But I was just so angry at the lightness with which arrest was taken, which this violence was taken in America. And I wanted to write about it. And I didn't want to just sort of hint around things the way art can do, right? I wanted to say clearly what was wrong. And so that's, that's how I became a writer. On top of the writing, you worked on a collaborative book about what was going on in Greece. The art itself changed, didn't it? But what, I, I remember you did this big, iconic series of paintings called Shell Game, where you basically... It, it reminded me of Hieronymus Bosch, only with, only with anti-capitalist cats. <laughs> um, and, and there's lots and lots of figures in every one, aren't there? They're all based around a big figure, which it symbolises something, and then a crowd of, a crowd of protesters. And suddenly, the crowd is, in, is almost like at the centre of what you're drawing. And, and, then, and then the drawings, they pick up the people, real people pick up your drawings and hold them up on demonstrations. I mean, this was cooler than any gallery show I've ever had. I had artwork that I would be sketching things from Occupy during the day, and then a few hours later, they would be out on the streets being used as protest so signs. So they just printed them and... and exactly, and ran, and, and, ran ran them them off, yeah. and ran them off and were holding them. And, you know, there's always this artificial dichotomy, right, between art, which is supposed to be terribly, uh, you know, frippery and, you know, politics, right? But I think both you and me are people that we have joined those two things. Well, I mean, the, the, for me as a, as a news journalist at the time, I mean, remember, I'd, I've been covering economics. I mean, and covering economics and business is, uh, you know, without wanting to, uh, to criticise anybody who does it, it is boring. I mean, literally, you know... I mean, it, it is the structure of the it, world it, and how it, it works. It, it is. You've got to try and interrogate it, but, you know, one quarterly result after another. And, and, and then I'm standing on, on Fifth Avenue in New York outside Lehman Brothers at 9 a.m., and there are people carrying their goods out in, in a paper box because the bank's gone bust. And then the state, the American state, steps in and saves capitalism. After 20 years, and remember, I had to take this stuff, you know, lying down for 20 years, that the state has no role in the system. And it was obvious to anyone that this form of capitalism was doomed. The way it changed my journalism is it unblocked me. All my colleagues on Newsnight used to say, we used to say, why are we so stilted? Why are we so unfree in the way we speak? And we kind of 
whisper to each other. It's because we said, because every one of us fears that we're going to say Bush is a war criminal, live on air. <laughs> uh, we were monitoring ourselves. We were monitor and, and monitoring yourself makes you kind of clench inside. It shrinks you, yeah. yeah. And, and suddenly, 2008 made me realise this form of capitalism is doomed. One of the things that strikes me is how much of our present moment comes out of that year, that year of 2011. There's a new series of horizontal networked protests, protests led by young people, led by queer people, led by women. Uh, in Puerto Rico, where my father is from, one third of the island was out in the streets protesting against the corrupt governor, Ricky Rosayo, and they drove him out of power the first time this had ever happened in Puerto Rican history. One third of people, right? There are um, protests in Iraq that are being met with extraordinary violence by the state, but still uh, young men and especially young women are out in squares, you know, asserting their dignity, asserting um, their right to live in a country that isn't a kleptocracy. And people in power often assume that what is driving these things are either pure economics or youthful unrest and they'll get over it. What's your take on what, it, what has made this repetitive pattern over and over again happened since 2011. I mean, you take the example of the of, of Lebanon or the Iraqi protests. It, it is people who are literally prepared to stand on the streets and be shot um, because they can't see a future. But what is it that you think they want? Dignity. I think people want dignity. People, of course, want decent jobs and they want to be fed. They want a power grid that works, right? But Above all, there's this sense of humiliation. In Puerto Rico, people carried signs and they chanted about dignity. Puerto Rico had had a, a hurricane uh, two years ago called Maria and 4,000 people died in the aftermath. And they didn't just die from like, you know, the storm or drowning, they, they died from neglect. Mm. From a neglect that was done by the American government because Puerto Rico is a colony and from a neglect by the corrupt local elite. And the spark that kicked off those protests was that the Puerto Rican Center for Investigative Journalism published chats where Ricky Rosayo, the governor, joke, and his friends were joking about feeding the bodies of elderly people who died in the hurricane to vultures. Mm. And so you went and drew that. And not only drew it, you took part in some of the reconstruction. Tell us about that, because, because again, it's like flu, it's like Boundary fluidity, isn't it? Exactly. It's, suddenly a journalist is an artist. Suddenly an artist is there trying to re, you know, rewire the grid. What does that feel like? I mean, when I went back, uh, I hadn't been back since I was a little kid, right? I hadn't been back since my grandparents had died. And I had not been as connected with that part of myself. And then when I saw not just that the hurricane had happened, but like my friends, you know, in the mountains that they didn't have any like running water or power, they had to wait online 20 hours for gas. I took the first flight I could afford down. The plane was entirely filled with other Puerto Ricans. And I, we were all carrying duffel bags filled with water filters and batteries and anything you can take. Because even if you're going to report, like what sort of jerk shows up uh, at their friend's house where their friend doesn't have any fresh food and where they have to get the water out of the side of the mountain and they don't bring anything to help, right? And for me, the thing that struck me the most was that what saved Puerto Rico, and this is what I think will save all of us in times of collapse and climate change, it was the solidarity of people. It was not the state. It was not the NGOs. It was not like rich people with a lot of money. It was people went to their elderly neighbors and they checked in on them and they set up uh, mutual aid kitchens. They cleared roads with machetes if they had to. They set up clinics. Um, people went from you know town to town in Puerto Rico to bring water. They set up a massive network of solidarity centers. And it was from these solidarity centers that the protests that overthrew the governor came. That it was from that, not just the centers themselves, but also that ethos, right, of we can do this. We have been abandoned, but we can do this. We have dignity. We have asserted our dignity by clearing our roads and feeding each other. So this play that I wrote uh, called Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere, which is based on a book, I tried to do a sort of instant history of the way elites worked out what to do about this explosion of hope and freedom. And they tried, first of all, censoring the internet. The next thing they tried was well, sometimes switching off the internet. This is what Erdogan did in Turkey. Um, the next thing is that they do the kind of propaganda and that doesn't work. But in the end, 
I think they came up with an ingenious solution, which should have been, uh, we should have expected because it's information theory 101. What sabotages an information network most effectively is noise. Exactly. And what they did is they said, stop trying to, to censor this stuff, just fill the entire infosphere full of rubbish. Exactly. And that, so what do we do about that? Me and you, in our own different ways, are trying to tell something that some people call truth. What do we do about that? It's something very hard, right? My last book was about Syria that I did with an amazing Syrian journalist, Marwan Hisham. And anyone who has reported on Syria knows that there is an intense disinformation campaign. Uh, war crimes by the Assad regime have been proven over and over and over again. And yet, on social media, on the internet, there's just this attempt to flood that space with doubt and to smear journalists and first responders, right? And it's very dispiriting at first, right, to, to us, you know, people who are trying to report. And I think for people who are trying to learn the truth, a lot of them just, they shrug their shoulders and they're like, everyone lies, it's all nonsense, and they sort of tune out. However, I think that sometimes one of the functions of art, right, art is to distill. And what we need now is focus as well. And with that, I want to open it up to questions. Uh, you've been talking about agency and the role of technology. Uh, so I would like to ask, what is your take on the role of technology for agency and self-determination of oppressed groups? It's a very mixed thing. For as long as American police have existed, they have murdered black people. This is something fundamental to America. And black people have reported on it and that black media has reported on it and white America has not believed them, right? And then suddenly there were cell phone cameras and suddenly there was social media and suddenly it became absolutely impossible to ignore the way that American police murder black people. I do not think that an uprising like Ferguson could have spread the way it did without social media. And I also don't think the movement for black lives could have spread without the constant documentation of, of these murders, right? On the other hand, the news of the Ferguson protests spread outside of Ferguson um, because of Twitter and not because of Facebook. And there's a very big reason for that, which is that at that time, Twitter did not use algorithmic filtering and Facebook did. And the Facebook algorithm privileged happy stories and congratulations. It didn't privilege uprisings against murder by the state. Now, Twitter is also using algorithmic filterings. And the same tools that we use to communicate with each other, that we use to organize and that we use to share truth can equally be used to turn us into like a bunch of numb Pavlov's dogs endlessly swiping for validation through our little glass boxes. And I think it's useful to realize that it's not, if you are addicted to social media, if you find yourself in this, it's not that you're weak, it's not that you're you know, stupid, it's that these are deliberately designed to addict yeah. people. So, so I would say, I want to answer in a different way. One of the only advantages of being 60 years old, which I turned last month, is that I remember a time when a, having agency was normal. So, so I was surrounded by people in, in my childhood and, and young adulthood who believed that what they did had an effect on the world. And there was, a, there was a strong reason for that, because they defeated fascism in World War II and they built a welfare state in this country uh, by, by wanting it when other people didn't. What I think that happened in what we call the neoliberal era, the free market era, is that we started to treat the market as if it was a machine that controlled our lives. And what does it inculcate? In a lot of young people, they don't believe that anything they do can actually change the outcome of their life. It becomes like going to a casino. Maybe I'm lucky and I win uh, the X Factor or Love Island or, or I become a premiership football player. Um, but if not, then it's just down to luck. Um, I find... I don't think this is due to, to do with technology, it's to do with our subordination to the market. And for me, what, one of the great things about what is happening and what information technology and networks does is that when you find, when you decide, I actually know I do have agency, like the people who went onto the streets of Turkey in 2013 and said, no, we can actually uh, resist all the kind of reactionary stuff that is around us. Suddenly, the first weapon that you have is, is, is information technology. That's why I think going forward, 
the, 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 the social media and the networks it's based on are a huge battleground. And everybody on that battleground needs to come clean about which side they're on. I think Mark Zuckerberg and all the owners of these big platforms need to decide whether they are going to sit there and defend hierarchy or whether they're going to defend and, and facilitate the agency of ordinary people. It's, it, it's that. You could almost say that is the question of the next 25 years. I'm originally from Chile. During Pinochet, he burned books and painted over all the murals. And uh, now uh, Piñera government is uh, allegedly withdrawing some uh, inconvenient books from the curriculum. So my question is, why uh, is art, and all, in all its expressions, so feared by dictators and their political heirs? I would maybe start by quoting a Mahmoud Darwish line about the fear of conquerors for memory. The purpose of a tyrant, right, is to make anything else unimaginable. The first dictatorship is the dictatorship in your mind that makes a different sort of rule, something unthinkable. And what art does is it breaks you out of that mental prison. Art lets you think that there is another way that people could live, that they could be, that they could interact in another sort of country that they could be in. And it doesn't have to be political art to do that. It doesn't have to be propagandistic. It doesn't have to be set, written by the same type of people or set in the same type of country. But just by virtue of being good art, it makes you imagine other possibilities. And that, that imagining of other possibilities, that is what tyrants and conquerors fear. I think I would add to that that... So I was in Greece reporting at a quite depressed time of, uh, you know, of at a time when people didn't have much hope between the 2011 uprising and then the 2015 when the left came to power. And you'd be in a bar and, and, and yeah, everybody's angry and they all want to do graffiti, anti-fascist graffiti, and, and some guy was murdered by the fascists and you want to go and you want to protest. And then some women came in dressed in, like, like you could, the best, the most polite way I can put it is, Victorian sex workers, sex workers from the 19th century. They looked simultaneously beautiful, but slightly kind of, you know, slightly like destroyed. And, and they started singing songs from the Second World War that were resistance songs. But what they were trying to do, what their art did, is it brought this multi-layeredness so that, so that some young person realises what's going on in my life is historic, it has an outcome, it, it, it can create beauty, even at the, the, the most horrible depths of despair and poverty and hunger and repression. I think that is what, this, that, that's what makes me want to engage both with the artists who do this kind of thing and also to constantly bring to journalism and writing that quality that Orwell had, that Hemingway had, that Martha Gellhorn had, we, you know, we call reportage literary non-fiction. There is a literariness to what the great writers of the 30s who covered the rise of anti-fascism did. And I think all that those of us who want to be good journalists can do is try to emulate that desire to, to put a, a sheen of hope and possibility onto what we write. Thank you. Thank you. The only thing that beats the politics of hate is the politics of solidarity. I am worried that, that, that this crisis of the self has a lot more energy to play out. All of these, these divisions of the working class, all of these divisions of working people, they keep us from realizing our collective power. So Molly, you've been on the road uh, in support of Bernie Sanders' presidential primary uh, campaign. Obama had the whole hope change thing, didn't he? But Bernie, it, 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 it's more nitty gritty. It's more sort of, it's more life and death than that, isn't it? Well, Bernie doesn't, he doesn't say hope, he says work. Yeah. I've been on the road uh, with Bernie. I've been speaking at some of the rallies and I've been documenting it by, by drawing the campaign. I've also just been volunteering a lot. I was... Uh, in NYCHA housing, which is like government subsidized housing for low income people in New York, knocking on doors. And 
Let me tell you, every single person, if we knocked on their doors, there was one of two responses. One is, politics is garbage, I don't vote because I might as well throw my vote into the trash, this is so stupid. And the other one was, I'm voting for Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is someone who comes out of movement politics, and at every single rally, he says, no president, however good, is actually going to be able to do this on their own. They can't do it on their own. What I need to get things done and also to keep me honest, right, is to have movements of people out in the streets putting pressure on the government to get things done. People aren't voting for him as a sort of abnegation of responsibility. They're voting for him because he has an incredible record of consistency and you pretty much know that he is who he says he is and he's going to try to do the things that he says he's going to do. And they're going to keep fighting for him to do that. Well, one of the images in 2011 that, that sticks with me is the bat symbol. Do you remember the bat? The, they shone, they shone the, 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 the figure 99% yes. onto the headquarters of the Rise, Verizon building. And the guy who did that... In, in the Illuminator, protest, yeah. Yeah, the Illuminator. Um, the guy who did that gave me this big thing about... It's, it, it was, he had a really kind of cool American accent. Uh, he, he kept saying, like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like Bruce Wayne, man. He kept saying, it's like Batman, only there is no... Batman. Uh, he said to me that there are no superheroes. The only superhero is going to save us is ourselves. And that's what that 99 means. It's us, the 99%. No, that then became politics, didn't it? It became Corbyn here. It became Syriza in Greece, which failed. It, Corbyn failed. Um, what do we do to stop, as it were, this new horizontal, networked, activist left politics just becoming the kind of last gasp of something? What do we do to make it go somewhere? I think that horizontal networked politics based on occupation, it's like love, that's what I said, right? Yeah. It's like love. And you don't make a marriage out of just the first <laughs> gasps of passion. Right. It's something else too. You need the love, right? You have right? to do the washing up as well. Yeah, you have, yeah. To, do, you have to do the washing up as well. It's, you, need, you need the love, right? You need that passion. You need it to get started, but you also need structure. And you need leaders and you need organizations. And especially you need these when the adversaries that are, are arrayed against you are so well-funded and are so organized and are so internationalist. Like there is a fascist internationalism. I think we are at, at a moment where it's impossible to see beyond it going either, you said fascism, and people sometimes go, oh, well, yeah, fascism. I think fascism is around a guy killed uh, in February Kurdish people in Germany because he was a fascist. There are something like 200,000 people in Brazil self-identify as Hitler supporters. We have to, I mean, the stakes are Bernie and the man you confronted in, 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 in was it Dubai? Yes, uh, it's Dubai. Donald Trump. He's not a fascist, but, but he is, as you say, enabling an international alliance of people who want to be violent, organized racist xenophobes and misogynists so i suppose what you know there's almost no point to having a discussion like this unless we actually do confront the question what are we supposed to do about this the only thing that beats the politics of hate is the politics of solidarity uh, the more that people can be sliced up into groups like us them citizen you know citizen illegal alien all, all of these these divisions of the working class all of these divisions of working people, they keep us from realizing our collective power. And there is a greater enemy that's pitted against all of us. And the only way that we can overcome these divisions is a fierce solidarity that acknowledges the different oppressions that we face, but that makes us fight for each other. I mean, to, for me, it's in my book, I've called it the crisis of the neoliberal self. You could say, in, in, in layman's terms, the crisis of the kind of pe people we became in 30 years of worship in the market. It, 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 there's quite an easy spillover for me. If you, if you believe the market benignly controls your life and it's impossible to second guess it and you can't go against it, everything the government does has to be approved by the market. No, to me, it's a no brainer that if, if you obey the market for 30 years and you begin to worship it and believe it has power over your life, then it fails, you know, the machine blows up in 2008. It's a logical thing for people to say, what else is there who I can obey? Uh, and I, for me, that's the, that's the deep thing. So for me, solidarity um, can go two ways. 
I spent, you know, a lot of at uh, the end of last year, 2019, campaigning for the Labour Party or in the UK general election. And, and me and a lot of other people thought, well, if we mention the fact that there's long queues at the emergency room in, in British hospitals, then and the government is responsible, then that's one of our issues. And we go to doorsteps and almost like 50-50, people would say, yeah, it's terrible. The Conservatives cut the health service. Other people would say, yeah, it's terrible, those long queues in the emergency room because of the people who are there the brown people, the East European people, and also the English people who are not deserving to be there, who have gone because they've got the... There's a myth that poor people go to hospital because, because they're soft, you know, because they can't take pain. So I'm worried. I am worried that, that, that this crisis of the self has a lot more energy to play out. I want to segue a little bit to talking about uh, refugees. We are living at a time where an unprecedented amount of people are being forced to leave their homes, first by war, but also by climate change, right? People literally will have to leave their homes to avoid dying. And countries that are countries that are, you know, safer or that are unscathed by climate change will have a choice, right? And that choice will either be to allow free movement into their countries or to set up concentration camps. And in Europe and in America, the answer has been to set up concentration camps. In America, there are concentration camps, everyone knows, that are holding you know, children, children who um, are refugees from Central America, right? Mm -hmm. And once a society sets up concentration camps, and whether or not you argue that society is fascist when it sets them up, it is going to become fascist. Mm. You cannot set up concentration camps and you cannot kill people at borders without it rotting your soul. I went to Morocco uh, before this, the, 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 the height of the refugee crisis, but when, it was, when one of the main routes was out of Morocco um, to the Mediterranean, and interviewed sub-Saharan African migrants who lived in the absolutely worst conditions I've ever seen anybody live in because it was a combination of violence by the Arab population against them and, and, and extremely poor, the poorest in a poor country, let's put it that way. And I, I remember sitting on a, on a patch of ground with some, some bricklayers from Niger and they said, why do you come? You know, I mean, come to Niger and find out. Um, you know, Niger happens to be one of the places where that that's going to be one of the most disrupted places by climate change. It's got very fragile ecology. We in in the developed world have to get used to the fact that they are coming and that and not and, and that they are human beings. Everywhere we go, we find the universality of human existence being under threat. That's why, for me, you know, what, what my work has taken in the direction of I, I call it radical humanism, but basically the idea that we have to defend the universality of humanness. I think that some of the most fundamental things that we've taken for granted, not in, just in my life, but in my parents' lives, lives after the war, are now under threat. I mean, do you agree that's the stakes we're, 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 kind, of, we're kind of facing? Absolutely. I mean, we're living at a time where someone with a good passport like me or you can travel freely across the earth, you know, guzzling carbon as we do. And someone with a bad passport is interned on the island in Lesbos and forced to sleep in a tent in the mud, in the snow, to the point where like kids freeze to death, right? And that's like a fundamental statement that the global order has made, that people with rich passports are human. And people who have bad passports and don't have money to you know, buy extenuating circumstances are not human. In New York a few weeks ago, there was an raid by immigration police on a Latino family. And in the course of the raid, the immigration police, ICE, shot a man in the face mm. who um, was not a man they were even looking mm. for. People from all around New York came and they surrounded the hospital. And of course they were shoved away and there weren't enough of them. And when there aren't enough of you, it's easy for the police to shove you away. But if there were more of them, if there were more of them, that would be what would change things. I'm hugely frustrated by the limitations of politics. See, like in, politicians in this country aren't allowed to say that one of the reasons that people so enthusiastically voted for Boris Johnson was that he gave them permission to be racist. This is a guy who says, who calls Commonwealth citizens grinning pickaninnies. 
and, and says that uh, Muslim women were wearing the should all look like letterboxes. No, no, and, co- and you know, apparently caused a spike in racist attacks when he wrote these things and said them. But if you can't admit that what the politics is doing is giving people permission to be racist, if you have to say, they're there, it doesn't matter, you're not really racist, you, you're never going to be able to break through. Uh, what frustrates me about politics is its euphemistic nature even now. Everyone's trapped in a euphemism. Uh, and I want to, I have this huge desire to break out of it towards a thing called truth. I mean, in the American context, can that happen? There's a difference between an intellectual and a politician. A politician's job is to get as many votes as they can so that they can get into power. And very often the way that you get as many votes as you can is you avoid saying that perhaps people didn't just vote for a man who says that he'll deport all the Mexicans in America just because they had economic anxiety, you know? So you think, you think, like me, the whole economic anxiety thing is just an excuse? I think it's more complicated than that. I think that there is also a lot of economic anxiety in Weimar Berlin. And also people are anti-Semites when they're willing to blame their economic anxiety on the Jews. I think that in America, it was proven that it wasn't actually people who were poor, who were even white people who were poor, who were voting for Trump, and that people who voted for Trump made more money than people who voted for Clinton. I think that people do have a fear of downward mobility that's based on real things. Mm. But I'm with you about the limits of politics. And then there's another limit of politics, which is the limit set by the climate. Like even the yep. best politician in the world cannot actually undo all of the damage that we've already done to the planet that will cause us to lose so many of the treasures of this world. And so in addition to politics, right, in addition to someone trying to win votes, you also have to make the world better yourself. And that's something that you do with your hands and your neighbors, right? And then as an artist or as a journalist, you're allowed to say things that sometimes <laughs> politicians can't. <laughs> well, with that, I think we should go to the next round of Q&A. Who wants to ask a question? Hi. So um, with impartiality being one of the key pillars of journalism, um, both of you are journalists and both of you have strong political stances. So on that, how does your activism fit your job as writers? And do you still think that the media can and should strive for impartiality today? I think that very often what has been called impartiality is actually an aesthetic, where someone speaks in a measured voice and they wear a grey suit. But if you look at... Mine's blue today. But if you look at how they uh, report things, you can see that it's anything but impartial. For instance, police in America have been proven to lie again and again about what happens when they shoot someone. Yet, statements by police are taken as fact by the impartial media, and they're not viewed as statements that come from a group that frequently lies. And that is a sort of bias that is hidden by the gray suit and the neutral voice. I think that the duty of a journalist is to truth. And sometimes when you say the truth, that sounds biased, right? Sometimes when you say the truth, you use strong and passionate words because that is what truth is. But for me, I just struggle to get it right. I don't wear gray suits. <laughs> I mean, I, I, was, I would say if you work for a state broadcaster or a publicly funded broadcaster in this country, in the, in the United Kingdom, you have a, a statutory duty to be impartial. I, I mean... And, and I quit because I don't think that that's the primary attribute of journalism. And so I, I, I want to be able to tell that truth by saying, look, for example, at Truth, Trump has said racist things. It's also true that um, our prime minister, Boris Johnson, repeatedly lied about things. So if I want to say Boris Johnson is a liar, uh, try saying it. Try saying it even if you're a guest on the BBC or, or on, on, on our regulated news, let alone a reporter, being a partisan of freedom, being a partisan of, of the struggle against fascism and racism and xenophobia and horribly violent misogyny, which is coming our way from your country into Europe. But millions of pounds are being spent by misogynist groups now. No, I want journalists to stand there on the front line. That's what we're supposed to do. I'd like to just go back to a very interesting moment in your conversation when Paul asked, 
what can we do about fascism? And then Molly spoke very movingly and powerfully about the fact that there are now concentration camps on our borders. It seems to me that is the question at the moment. You talked a lot uh, this evening about the desire to bring truth into the public sphere. But how can we, when we're faced with the kind of noise that you were talking about earlier, the insane clamour of racism in our ears, how can we bring that truth really into the public eye and actually make a difference through it? People need to put their bodies on the line. And by this, I don't mean large ceremonial permitted marches where, you know, you go to like the center of the city and you hold your like cool sign and you go home, even though those marches are awesome, like nothing, no, no, no slight to them. But the things that have actually stopped fascist policies in, in America, for instance, the, the Muslim ban was it first stopped, was people going to the airports and taxi drivers going on strike, right? Taxi drivers who are largely Muslim immigrants in New York themselves. When people are willing to put their bodies in the line and peacefully use their bodies to stop the machinery of fascism, that is what works, in my opinion. Well, Luca, I would just add to that. Memory um, is important. Some of the first people in Europe who did that uh, were the Dutch, the workers of Amsterdam, who went on strike. And the strike, they, you can go to the museum and see the, the mimeographed leaflet. And it says they're trying to take the Jews out of Amsterdam. We're striking. I mean, we objectify the history of the struggle against fascism. There's a kind of big heroic moments. And then, and then we forget the rest of it. These were ordinary people. And what I come to the conclusion is that what happened in the 1930s was the emergence of, of something you could call an anti-fascist morality. It's not just politics. It was a, a deep-seated almost incandescent, hope-filled desire to, what you did, just said, put your body between a fascist and their objective. So I think it, it is that. And how, how ironic is it that, that in America, if this programme was going on in America, if we said anti-fascism, that's almost equated with terrorism now in Trump's lexicon. Antifa is, it, he calls them terrorist anti-fascists. Now, now, think about that, because all the people you celebrate from the movie Casablanca, right through to the history of the Warsaw Ghetto, they were anti-fascists. The other thing that I would say is that the more people, the more numbers of people are involved in something, the less risk there is for anyone else. So how do we stop fascism? It's massive amounts of people, and people not just from the targeted group, it can't just be their responsibility, right? But people from the groups, that's like the majority group, the privileged or powerful group, mass numbers of those people peacefully, peacefully putting their bodies into the, into the sort of spokes of the machinery of fascism to trip it up. If I may just jump in as well, I think there is another bit of it that we, couldn't, we mustn't exonerate, yeah. the so-called liberal centre, the, the, yes, the, the, yes. the liberal centre in, 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 yeah. in, in, in politics. Hannah Arendt, uh, the German philosopher, described fascism as, and I, when I use this term, I'm, I'm criticised now, she described it as the alliance of the elite and the mob. Uh, okay, no, I think this is what we're seeing across Western society. Uh, r very rich people and very angry poor people al allied in, in favour of racist and misogynist politics. The lesson of the 1930s is that that is such a strong alliance that the only thing that works against it is an alliance of the centre and the left. But the centre has got to want to be part of the alliance. Exactly. Where they, where they overcome the cynicism and say, you know what, I am going to fight it. So I worked um, in the general election doing social media um, and I think an overwhelming frustration is, you know, how, how is this engagement going to translate into votes at the ballot box? Algorithms favour certain content um, and we exist in bubbles online. And I guess my question to you is, have we overestimated social media, whether it be from 2011 um, in the Arab Spring and um, even in terms of the the upkeep of the activism through um, Black Lives Matter as well. I think uh, social media is incredibly important. It's just not the only thing. And it's also, it's sometimes important in indirect ways. For instance, every single journalist is on Twitter and they're all narcissistically checking their mentions all of the time. So if you have a story that, you know, is very, very important, but that those journalists would not typically cover, probably Twitter is a really good way to get them to cover it, right? And then that will break it outside of the algorithmic bubble that we find ourselves trapped in. Social media is also a really good way to mobilize your bubble of volunteers to actually leave their homes and knock on doors and speak to other people that aren't in your bubble. It's good for some things, but it, 
cannot be the only thing. What we haven't explored the limits of are what human beings can do in squares and streets together. In a single hour in Cairo, in 2011, people went from saying, bread is too expensive, to we want freedom, down with the government. The people demand the fall of the regime. I think all over the world, the people really do demand the fall of the regime. And they know the regimes don't fall on the internet. They fall in, in, in scrappy, concrete-strewn streets full of tear gas. That's where regimes fall. And I, I am convinced that large numbers of regimes will fall in the next 10 years. And I hope it comes quicker. <laughs> Mm. Fast enough for me to see it, see it all happen. So we were asked to give an end thought. Yeah, we? we have to give an we end thought. We have to give an end thought because yeah. the, the end is coming near. Do you want to give yours? We've hammered on a lot about truth and about art and about solidarity and about the things that only humans can do. And my final thought is that as the world is burning around us and as all of these terrible politicians are clinging on to power and as you know grassroots revolutions are being crushed we need to reconnect with ourselves and our friends and our family and the physical world and with our hands because if climate collapse happens mm -hmm. when disaster happens the networks will not work anymore the cell phones <laughs> won't work the social media will all be down and the only thing that you will actually have to count on is the people that are around you and the things that you can all do together yourselves with your own hands and bodies. And all I can add to that is I come from a left tradition that thought it had time. Rosa Luxemburg, the German revolutionary, said the revolution marches to victory through a series of defeats. And Martin Luther King said the arc of the universe is long, but it tends towards justice. But it's not long anymore. We've only got 30 years to decarbonize the planet. And so that ingrained mentality that we on the left have had, that we, we might be defeated this time, but our children, you know, oppressed peoples always say that, don't they? Our children will avenge us. Um, they might not. They, they, I, we've got probably 30 years, these are critical 30 years. And I hope that everyone who's in, as engaged with politics as you clearly are in this audience, takes strength from that because we can actually, we can really rescue this planet. Yes, a high five. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. There's no punchline to state violence. Yeah. Sometimes stuff is just bad. Pop culture is not innocent. It's coded with all kinds of politics. The white mainstream feels that, that a shift is happening. They're nervous. They're nervous. Yeah. I like my feminists sort of murder-free. <laughs>